Good morning, and thanks for joining me for today's FS Club webinar on how effective competition can improve value for money in public procurement. This morning we're joined by Matthew Rees, Director of the Commercial Hub and Insights team at the National Audit Office. Matthew will present the findings and recommendations of his recent report titled Competition in Public Procurement. The UK government spends over £250 billion every year on the procurement of goods and services. Whilst it is broadly agreed principle that competition can help support efficiency, innovation and quality in public services, the government has yet to define what effective competition is. And when competition is lacking or ineffective, ineffective I should say, other safeguards are required. Otherwise, value for money can be reduced through higher prices, inefficiencies and poorer outcomes. The new Procurement Act is due to be rolled out this year and is underpinned by illustrative scenarios that suggest increased competition could deliver savings of between 4 to 7.7 .7 billion per year. Over his successful career, Matthew has led a wide range of National Audit Office studies, including on the use of supply chain finance in the NHS, the privatisation of Royal Mail, the UK Guarantee Scheme for Infrastructure Investment and Landscapes of Government and Infrastructure um, UK Guarantee Scheme for Infrastructure Investment and Landscapes of Government Companies and Financial Institutions. Matthew qualified at KPMG where he worked on public sector audit before moving to corporate finance and investment banking. He has served as a non-exec director at GemServe Limited, a business process outsourcing company, and is a member of the ICAEW Supervisory Council. And his public sector career spans the Competition and Markets Authority and the Single Source Regulations Office. Now, um, before I hand over to Michael to discuss the recommendations of his report, I'll note that we do have a few polls uh, throughout the webinar this morning, so do stay attentive and make sure you do um, answer the polls as quickly as possible. And also um, do put your questions in the chat box because we'll have um, about 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of Matthew's presentation, and he is very keen to hear your um, feedback and suggestions. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm Charlotte Dove Rashley. I'm the manager here at um, FS Club at CN. I'd also like to thank our very generous sponsors who enable us to bring you these uh, webinars on a wide range of content across finance, technology, and economics. We'll be sharing the uh, link to the report in the chat box there. And this uh, session will be recorded and available to watch on our website within 48 hours. Now, um, I think that's all of the housekeeping out of the way, so it's my pleasure to hand the virtual floor over to you, Matthew. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully people will see the full screen in one second, as I've just maximised that. There we go. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, a lot of this is going to be things for you to help us with. Uh, this report was published last year, and uh, what I'd like to do is very quickly run through the context, why we did this, the findings, what we found, the recommendations, what we think um, will improve uh, outcomes in competition and public procurement. Um, so um, context, um, we, we publish a lot of NEO reports, so there are about 60 value for money reports a year. We think that um, getting, um, get, getting competition to work properly in public procurement is really important. Uh, what we did with this report was do a lot of group workshops and we looked at our past reports. Um, but for those who look more closely at public procurement, we didn't look at the NHS uh, and we didn't look at anti-competitive activity. So if you want to look at the report, obviously we'll provide the link, but you can also scan the QR code uh, very quickly before I move to the next slide. Um, <laughs> you've got just a second to do that. Um, the, um, the right hand side is too small to read, I get that. So if you want to look at page 46 of the report, you'll see our full case study list. Um, th this is a, a very substantial programme of, of value for money studies. Uh, we've published 209 reports over the last 20 years. So there's a lot of evidence that supports what we say. Um, and obviously all of it is looking at how well government is performing. Um, so for this competition review, we actually looked at a subset of 18 reports, and I'm going to take you through some of the key lessons that, that we drew out of those reports. Um, but before we get into um, sort of detail, I'd, I'd like to just sort of put the spend into context. So if you look at the chart here, you'll see that there's, there's actually more spend on public procurement every year than there is income tax income. 
So it's it's quite a significant um, question for for um, for when we look at value for money. And um, I'd like to bring up the first poll, really, which is just to kind of ask the audience as you know, do you think that having more bidders delivers better value? So um, this is in a sort of net promoter style. So um, let's see, see where people are and we'll, we'll kind of get the results. Oh, that's that's excellent to see this is moving uh, sort of set. Oh, it's becoming more even. <laughs> There we go. This like the psychology of seeing the results helps the audience swing swing the outcome. Um, I think we're sort of settled settled. There we go. So somewhat to strongly, I think that that, that the positive side have it. So that's re really good to hear that there's some some pro market views in 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 the in the audience here. Excellent. So um so it's actually quite interesting because the government actually finds it quite difficult to quantify these benefits, but the methodology behind these savings targets of 47.7 billion are based on a, a, the concept of adding more bidders into the market. Um, so um, that, that's great to get your feedback on that one. Um, now, I, um, as, as Charlotte mentioned at the beginning, there's a new procurement act. Um, you, you'll need to do your own research on this. I'm just highlighting the fact that since the uh, EU exit, there's been a lot of domestic legislation. Um, so one thing that's really important this year for anybody, whether you're a seller to government or a buyer in government, is that you need to get your mind around the new procurement legislation. Our report took this into account, but obviously we did the report last year and the legislation is coming uh, this year. So we need to get get, get ourselves uh, into the frame of mind for, for, for that. Um, there's a bit of context for, for you. Um, now, in ter terms of the detail then, um, competition is supposed to be a core principle for public procurement. Um, there's a lot of text on here, but essentially when we think about how how contracts are awarded and how value for money is delivered. The principle of treating suppliers fairly uh, and the equality and how that's sort of delivered is really kind of embedded in the legislation. Um, and then the other aspect of it, which comes up a lot in the parliamentary debates that, that I've been part of from, from a kind of NAO support is um, the engagement of SMEs and the removal of barriers to entry. So um, you know, we see we see these principles in legislation, um, but I'm going to bring up the second poll in a minute, and if um, Sasha, if you perhaps bring that up, and then we'll, we'll have a sort of sense of what what people think about um, how well this comes through. So the question here is, I think competition is a core principle of public procurement, and effective competition supports good value for money. So let's see, let's see where people's sentiments are there. Well, wow, we've got some 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 even more strong kind of starters there. It's great to see the strongly agrees get in their votes first, and and they, they're sort of trying to keep ahead of the <laughs> ahead of the rest. So we've got some good competition working there. Um, excellent. Well, that's really good to see. So um, I think that we're sort of that we're in the pro market effective competition world of mindset. Um, a little bit more context before we get into the into the findings. So the principles of competition, these are strongly embedded in um, in the Treasury's guidance. Um, there's actually a little decision tree from our report about the different terminologies that apply. Um, so th this aspect of um, on the right hand side, if you look at the report more, more closely, these procedures, um, particularly the open procedure, is deemed to be the most kind of uh, engaging of the market, whereas the framework side has, it has a slightly different context of a two stage process where you have a list of suppliers who compete to be on a framework. And then you have ideally a mini competition in which people then bid to be uh, awarded the contract. Um, and we're actually doing some work at the moment on the frameworks side of things. And um, so more to come on that in due course. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of kind of um, detail in the guidance there. Um, it gets even, even um, more nuanced when you start to think about the way that um, these, these procedures work. Um, and what, what's happening this year in, in the public procurement legislation is aimed to be a simplification of these competitive principles. Um, so what we've got on the, on the table is f five um, different procedures um, and they're going to be consolidated down into uh, to the competitive flexible procedure. Um, 
But actually, when we looked at the data, we found that there's um, there's an other choice um, quite a lot of times. So, so one of our findings actually was that you know quite a lot of times the data doesn't really give you a clear sense of of how much competition is being used. Um, so th this this is a kind of a simplification exercise the government is is um, engaged in at the moment. Um, I'm going to bring up the the third poll right now, if that's okay, uh, and we'll just get some kind of quick feedback from people on. Um, whether you think that the new legislation, and maybe you're not familiar with it, but what we're keen to know is, will these changes to procurement in October lead to better outcomes? So it's very, very interesting to see much, much more kind of in the middle ground there. Um, neutral, don't know. That's, that's really helpful. But I think once we get away from that center point, we have we have a few. At least good good to see some people in the agree and str strongly agreed. Uh, so thank you very much for your participation. It's great great to see so much quick fire response in that. And um, before I get into our, our our next section on findings, I just wanted to highlight a few other things in the wider domain. Um, obviously we talk a lot to the the CMA. Uh, it was mentioned in, in the intro that I used to, to to work at the Competition Commission, which came before the CMA. Um, the anti-competitive side of, of um, procurement is their responsibility. This is not something that we looked at in detail in our report, but we're looking at the positive aspects of how competition should be working and the CMA enforces when things are not working. Um, the other side of things, again, a part of my own kind of background around defence contracts is there are contracts where it is not possible to have competition because uh, either for security or defense industrial purposes, there's just not the, the industrial base or the supplier base or the national security um, advantages would be, uh, well, there'd be disadvantages from, from having a wider market. So there is regulation there as well. Um, and then the, th the sort of final piece that we didn't look at quite explicitly is we carved out of our report all of the COVID related activity. There's a public inquiry going on at the moment that people will be familiar with. Um, and um, you know, if you want to know more about the, the pandemic related stuff, certainly follow that. Um, but our report was, was deliberately looking at the business as usual post the pandemic. Um, so, so lots of wider reading for those who are interested in that. Um, so findings. Um, the, 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 I mean, overall, um, I know just just some quick points here is that it, departments, public authorities should be using competition. As Charlotte mentioned in the intro, the the definition of effective competition needs a little bit of kind of attention. We felt um, the benefits of procurement again, the quantification that could also be sharpened up. Um, and whilst we could certainly see the concept of competition is understood, it, the question is really consistency of implementation. Um, and we've certainly heard when we engage with suppliers, concerns about high bid costs and how evaluation is performed. So some of that lack of feedback or lack of clarity of feedback is, is something that actually the new procurement act is intended to improve. So we look forward to seeing that working much better. Um, the framework side, yes, I mean, certainly we found in our data, and we'll show you in a minute the data, and the use of frameworks is definitely increased. Frameworks um, is, as I say, two stages. Who is on a framework and who gets awarded the business is a two-stage process. Um, and then the, the final piece was, you know, we felt departments really need to understand how to establish the right conditions, uh, and hopefully some of the recommendations I've come on to will help with that. Um, the data side of things, right? So um, we'll call up another poll in a minute. <clears throat> but um, what we found was um, that 63%, um, 60, um, it depends on the value of volume of contracts, have some form of competitive flag. Um, there is about 24% uh, by volume, 5% by value of direct awards, and then a significant chunk of extended contracts. This report did not dive deeper into that, that sort of level of detail, but of course, how much competition and, and what sort of competition and what the reasons for the contract extensions there were is, is obviously important. Um, the other thing we looked at is, you know, a proportion of contracts which only had one bidder. Now, that, that means perhaps that there isn't enough supply market out there. Um, so that, that's been quite a significant proportion as well, about 23% of the contracts. Um, if we Pull up the um, uh, the poll on this one. Be useful to get a sense from from the audience 
Um, um, if, if you think the data that we're showing here indicates that there's a healthy level of competition in public procurement. Uh, mixed, no, no strong agreements is interesting there. Oh, one, one person has come in with that, one person. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, yeah, so really, really a, a, a much, much, much more nuanced mixed picture there. Um, I think I think I'd perhaps, perhaps be in the same kind of areas of doubt on that one. Um, the increase in use of frameworks briefly, um, you can look at the report, that's just the data there. I do want to get into our recommendations, so I'll skip skip on to that. Um, the other thing, just, you know, the European Union's Court of Auditors have looked at this area as well. So obviously, you know, UK is now outside of the EU, but the theme of public procurement and competition is a, you know, it's an international concept. So if you're interested in understanding what's happening in the EU member states, please have a look at that report. It came out just before Christmas and it's well worth read. Um, frameworks I've mentioned, uh, I mean, th there are benefits and risks. So two stages and um, the, the, the benefits of this is you can standardize what you need. Uh, you can get the suppliers lined up, you can save time. Uh, and reduce administrative burden. So in theory, very, very useful tool. Obviously the risks, and we highlighted these are coming from our report. So the risks are inflated prices that are then not bid down through a mini competition at call off, um, the use of um, you know, short, short lists of suppliers that aren't, um, aren't, aren't representative of a market. Uh, again, the Procurement Act is intended to resolve some of that by allowing frameworks to be open to, to new suppliers to enter them periodically. Um, and the other thing we found in our report is the number of suppliers on these frameworks can vary significantly. Um, so those with only one or two suppliers, about 11%, and those with over 20 suppliers, about half. Now, we're not saying what the right number is. Uh, I think it, it, it really very much depends, but we're certainly keen to understand how well that's delivering value through, through procurement. Um, it's a bit of our findings there worth, worth dipping into a bit more. Um, so fi finally, sort of final section, hopefully we'll you know, kind of get into some of the, kind of what the recommendations now. Um, the, the, the page 33 has some detailed text. What I just wanted to highlight was on the, on the left here, what, what are the enabling factors for effective competition? Um, and we've just highlighted these themes that came out of our workshops with um, suppliers and government departments. So having the right skill and capability to understand the market's capability, it's really important, essential to really for buyers to set really realistic expectations for what they need so that these requirements can be met by its supply base. The, the clarity and fairness of communication is obviously really important to ensure that everybody that's seeking to supply is able to understand what, what they're being asked to do and how they can um, uh, put forward their best bid. The choice, I mean, facilitating choice for, for, uh, for the buyer through both, you know, all stages of the procurement is really important. Um, and really making sure that there's both an opportunity for um, suppliers to satisfy the requirement, but particularly where there's an opportunity to innovate and offer a different way of doing things. Uh, that clearly, clearly brings advantage. And then the deliverability, um, you know, is this something that the supplier can deliver uh, and can it be done at the right price with the right profit or return? Um, so the, these are all what we've discovered as enabling factors. And um, you know, we didn't bring these up from our own thoughts. We tried to engage with a cross section of, of the map market to really make sure that that was working. Um, so we, we then, then made some recommendations um, and we broke our recommendations into two, two sections for the center of government which we've got on the page here, and then some much more detailed recommendations for practitioners, which, which I'll, I'll use to round out the discussion. Um, so, so for the centre of government, there were three around the quality of data. I think, you know, as you can see from your own poll reactions, that data doesn't always give a clear picture. So contract databases and standards need to be improved. That's clearly something government has in mind for the Procurement Act. Um, improving the quality of data that's submitted. Again, the, the Procurement Act sets out quite a lot of changes there. Um, and making sure that the data that is being collected is used properly to really analyze competitive trends. And um, so we're, we're hoping that, that um, 
government will be able to take forward this, those three. And then on the guidance side, um, really the, the early market engagement uh, is a theme which we felt needed uh, better, better guidance. How do public buyers really look at the way that the market is going to a, a supply their own requirements? That, that market engagement is an important theme. Um, frameworks I've mentioned, so you know, we feel there should be better guidance on frameworks and then improvements in overall uh, the use of competition really to drive through value. Um, so th those are our recommendations to the centre of government. Um, before I get into the practitioner level, there's been a public accounts committee hearing on this as well. Uh, so I've just highlighted in yellow there some of their recommendations. Um, and you know, it, it's useful that they, they replicate some of what we're saying, take it a little bit further in terms of the time scales which they expect government to respond to this. Um, so if you if you're interested in reading a bit more, please please do look up the public accounts committee report on this, and and you'll see the the context for the hearing and why those recommendations came out. So um, I've just got now to, I'm going to just focus on what we've described as our recommendations for practitioners. There's quite a lot on this slide. Ba basically, if you look at the QR code, you'll be able to get access to a, a guide called Managing the Commercial Life Cycle. And I'm going to talk through the, the sort of six boxes in the middle here in the, in the last few, few minutes of my talk. Um, so th this is um, the sort of procedural stages of a procurement. Uh, and they take you through the full life cycle from what, what you need, the requirement, how you buy it, which is the sourcing approach, what the market's doing to market the market monitoring, and then the process, the contract management, and then the review and transition and exit. So we took that structure and, and we broke this down into aspects which we felt could help practitioners to, um, to get better value through competition. Um, and I'll just take them two at a time um, with, a, with a bit of con context. So on the requirements side, you know, we feel that, that um, you know, Public authorities really need to use their knowledge of the market and be clear about the requirements which they have, and they need to really be clear about how they identify the benefits and costs. Um, and we've got three case studies there. There isn't time to go into the detail, but the one on the electronic monitoring program really highlighted the challenges of, of um, when the requirement is not clear and the technical ability to deliver that requirement is not in the market, that became a problem. Um, but this is, you know, there, there are other examples where that has worked well. Um, so that those requirements, the sourcing approach, and um, you know, the, the highlighted report there on HS2 showed that actually the approach to source the um, the, the suppliers was um, a little bit confused. Um, obviously, the costs of HS2 have been high subject to public debate, um, and it's actually led to, you know, massive decisions on how far that line will actually be able to go. Um, so what we're saying here is that you know, the sourcing is a really important aspect to get the best route to the market, consider delivery and integration, uh, and understand also the risks of supply failure and how those will be managed. And we've done some further work around supply failure recently, so you can, you can find that on our website. The second two blocks, market monitoring and, and process. So on, on the market monitoring side, you know, it's really important that public authorities understand the wider context in which their particular procurement fits uh, and understand also where the collective buying can actually deliver benefits. Um, so there's a lot of these aspects of central purchasing which um, can be done through to, to really understand the markets, to engage with them. What we found in our report though was that public authorities were nervous about how much to engage with the market. Um, um, and actually, you know, perfectly valid to do this and understand what's possible. Um, the, um, the three examples there um, have highlighted different aspects of this. The fire and rescue and the police procurement was really an opportunity to standardise, but we felt from those both of those reports that that opportunity wasn't being maximised. Um, then on the process and agreement stage, um, you know, it's really important to get the right contract in place uh, to ensure that, that there's enough time for suppliers to meet those requirements, um, but also through the process to provide good feedback to both the winner and the losers to enable future procurement to, to work better. Um, so that, that's our aspect on, on um, process and agreement. 
and then the final two sections as i sort of rushing through through this to give us time for some q a and um, when when we're looking at contract management and um, you know this is it's really important to see uh, a procurement as uh, the first stage of a long-term relationship um, so on that side you know it's really important to make sure that when 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 a managing contract is enough of a mobilization period that suppliers can settle into their role uh, that that particularly the supply chain is able to understand what's need required from them and that um you know there's enough data and process to to make sure that objectives are met um, and on the on the procurement act again that there's going to be quite a lot more information coming through in terms of key performance indicators on contracts um so aspects of that uh, that, that we highlight on, on this report we took from um, three different case studies that the rural broadband program was um, was one where actually BT ended up taking a significant um, proportion of the hard to serve areas, um, and perhaps it wasn't as quite well appreciated at the beginning as to how, how what the obligation was to meet all of the residents of the UK with their broadband requirements and how that would be delivered. Um, and then we've looked at aspects of the adult social care market where actually it's become a quite a significant regulatory responsibility to monitor the financial performance of of these providers. Um, and that, that's a theme that's come up in recent work I mentioned about supply failure. Um, and then finally, on the, the review, transition and exit, um, basically we, we found that, that that's an area of um, planning, forward planning that's really needed to make sure that there's enough um, both uh, contingency planning in case that there is an, an, a forced exit um, but there's also an attempt to come back into the market at the end to make sure that if you need to re-procure, uh, you can do that. Um, so, um, yeah, we've just got a few few more recommendations on there. Um, and we have one final poll, I think, Charlotte, we could just pull up the um, uh, discussion feedback thing and just see, see as I cantered through that at pace, what, what people's sort of overall thoughts were. Did, did we... <laughs> One person's voting. There we go. Go a few more. We held a few people into this to the end. That's great. Um, so um, some quite good. Some room to improve. I think is, is, it sounds like. <laughs> um, excellent. Okay. So um, Charlotte, yes, if we've got questions, um, be delighted. Oh, yeah, we to, do indeed. To... Um... Thank you very much, Matthew. You managed to cover a lot actually really clearly in such a short um, time time period. So we'll get on to questions. Um, Phoebe has asked if you could please elaborate on how the new legislation can support government to utilise pre-commercial procurement to deliver a more competitive procurement tool, particularly for innovative solution development. Um, well, I, I mean, I think that the, the it sounds like I'm dodging the question. I mean, the, the new procurement is um, is a concept. It hasn't been implemented yet. I mean, what what I can certainly see from what's planned is that there'll be sort of simplification um, on on the, on the procurement procedures. Um, but buyers need to put a lot more kind of commercial thought into what they need and how they're going to get that from the market. So I think I think the emphasis is being shifted towards making sure that the buyer has a really clear view of what it wants. Uh, it's being granted more flexibility, but with that flexibility comes the responsibility to be, to be you know, much more strategic about things. Um, so you know, all the way through that kind of sourcing kind of structure, and if you look to talk about it in government language, it's the sourcing playbook, um, you know, that, that engagement with the market and the way that the market is approached is, is going to be more flexible for for the buyer um, and ideally that will lead to the right outcome for the right price the right quality more often thank you uh, bob has asked what's your view of, on payment by results contracts and um, well we have we haven't done a detailed analysis of payment by results contracts um, but I mean, all, all contracts are supposed to be delivering a result for a payment. I know that sounds very glib. Um, the particular detailed aspects of contractual kind of incentive and return and obligation 
you know, they vary. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think we, we I feel like we need to have a much more detailed evidence base to be able to say that particular design is delivering a particular enhancement or improvement or better value for money. Um, you know, we, we tend to stick to our evidence and findings rather than provide any sort of overarching kind of, um, you know, approval or, or kind of conclusion on these things. Mm. That sort of leads nicely on to uh, Jim's question, which is, do government departments have the capability to conduct effective evaluations, or is it too easy to pick large suppliers irrespective of their capability? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, so, so, I mean, I, you know, anybody in the role of um, going out to market in a procurement, uh, and I've certainly been in this sort of position myself, spends a lot of time trying to design and, and specify what's needed and put together an appropriate evaluation um, you know, matrix, you know, criteria uh, scoring system. Um, and it, it, it takes a lot of effort to get it right. And I think part of the challenge is when supply, you know, when a, when a requirement is really urgent or the skills and capabilities aren't in place, then it, it becomes very challenging to get that right. Um, so some of the, the benefits of frameworks is to really standardize where it's possible uh, so that these, these processes uh, can be streamlined. And then hopefully that gives more resource to the more complex and innovative aspects of procurement. Um, you know, and certainly when we look at large departments, they certainly have a, you know, a clear distinction between what they regard as generic and common versus you know, elaborate and specific. Okay. Um, looking at more than the uh, financial costs now, Mark has asked that, um, well, he said that the emphasis on competition and public procurement in the past has been at the expense of societal criteria, like social value and well-being of future generations. Uh, the submission has proved very costly to the taxpayer. Uh, how far does the new Procurement Act truly move the dial towards selecting companies of proven good character? Um, well, it's, certainly there are quite a few aspects there that you could kind of draw, draw out. So, I mean, in terms of um, how the Procurement uh, Act is, is looking at supplier performance, I mean, that there is certainly much more attention to uh, understanding supplier performance and even moving towards an understanding of debarment in certain circumstances. So, that the, 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 the new legislation, I think, gives the, the, to the the government a bit more kind of um, strength in really understanding performance quality delivery track record. Um, the um, you know there's always been a sense actually that um, government doesn't aggregate and learn from from its its broader purchasing. So so I think we'd certainly see some some improvement hopefully there. Um, in terms of the kind of emphasis on things around social value or competition, um, I mean. At the, at the heart of the, cent, of the um, competitive flexible procedure is an opportunity to be more explicit about what, what the criteria are, both you know for the requirement and the award. Um, but as I say, it's, you know, early early days because it hasn't been um, it hasn't been you know rolled out yet. Um, and I think it's certainly something we'll be we'll be coming back to look at in due course. Okay. Uh, Martin has spent many years working with specialist SMEs selling into the public sector and he said that the huge cost of bidding through possibly more than one major government supplier frequently made bidding uneconomical. Uh, could the government administer a list of approved specialist suppliers that potential major contractors could use rather than individually going through expenses and time consuming supplier evaluations? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I could emphasize with that that discussion. It came up in the public accounts committee um, hearing as well. How, how does government reduce barriers to entry for SMEs and facilitate their their um, position as a potential supplier? Um, I mean, I, I think I think it requires effort all the way through these things. Um, I mean, there, there are within the, the frameworks and, and dynamic purchasing systems that um, Crown Commercial Service and, and some large public authorities run um, opportunities for suppliers to be part of frameworks, parts of more specialized lots, so that they're, they're registering once and being uh, 
hopefully successful in, in contract award. Um, we, we're starting to look actually at that in a bit more detail to, to look at how how routinely um, government is is choosing from a wide pool of suppliers. Um, uh, I mean, so so I think I think it, it's 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 a known issue that that there is a an inevitable cost um, of um, supply registration and that sort of administrative side of it is is a cost to to the um, to the supplier. Um, uh, and I think government sort of recognises that it needs to do more to make it easier to register and be a supplier. Um, but, but obviously the, the award decision needs to be in, in the hands of you know, an individual public authority to decide on the right grounds what, what the selection criteria are and how it was awarding the contract. Um, you know, the, this, these contracts are not, not unfortunately, like walking into a price comparison website or, or, or a supermarket, you know, they, they are more um, complex and, and, and they do require rigour. But, you know, I think where government is trying to move is to be, you know, understanding what's best in the commercial world so that these processes can can work, um, you know, for a wider pool of, of suppliers. Siobhan's interested in your findings around framework agreements. Can you expand a little on your recommendations regarding these? Yes, I mean, I think we're we're looking at the moment at central purchasing and trying to think about how they deliver efficiency. I think I think what we found um, probably a su surprise when we looked at the data is how much they've grown as a proportion of spend. So we're, we're certainly, we ourselves are interested in just unpicking that a little bit more. Um, th th there is a, as I said on that slide, there's some clear advantages of having standard um, requirements and pre-existing lists of potential suppliers. I, I think the question that we've heard in our workshops is whether that leads to a fair distribution of contracts uh, for the members of the, of the framework. Um, so we're looking at that a little bit at the moment. And then the Procurement Act itself has recognised the need for um, the ability for a framework to admit new potential suppliers so that, so that we don't find that, that all of the business um, is awarded for a prolonged number of years to a to a predetermined list of suppliers. Um, so there, there's 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 changes there which are on on the government's agenda. And hmm. um, sort of casting our minds back uh, to 2020, Clive has asked, what should the government have done to improve overpayment and uh, cronyism and COVID contracts in a time where rapid action was needed? Yeah, I mean, we, as I said during the presentation, this this report isn't about COVID procurement. Um, you know, what what we we've obviously published reports on COVID procurement, uh, and we've seen a significant proportion of direct awards. Um, the procedures for emergency procurement, you know, are, have have actually required a bit of new guidance on them. Um, I, I think the data quality is also an issue, you know, the completeness and accuracy of that, that data has been, been a theme. Um, but I think the, you know, the government's other actions now to, to ensure that where it's um, either um, received substandard product or, or it's not received the product at all. I mean, that, that's actually now that the government needs to take its own um, action, whether that's legal action or contractual enforcement or negotiation. Um, so certainly it's it's a it's an ongoing theme um but as i said i mean we've been trying with this report to look at the more business as usual phase beyond the pandemic just to understand at a sort of both the kind of theoretical and practical level how competitive rivalry can lead to better outcomes in procurement mm -hmm. um sean has asked if you see any issues with capacity um, and resource issues for government with the impending changes uh, in particular in the wider public sector, which has additional financial pressures. Yeah, I, it's, a really, you know, it's a really vital area. Um, I think the, with the legislation having passed last year with an implementation for this autumn, the, the pressure and focus is now on every public authority to get ready. Um, you know, actually retaining people within this environment is challenging. There's budget pressures on every public authority, um, and so I think that that is you know, it's a fair question. 
whether every public authority has the, the resources and the capability in place to get the best out of this. Um, but, you know, with the, as I said, with the data, you know, we, we've got more overall spend here per year than we have in overall income tax revenue. So it, it, it's, it's vital that all public authorities take seriously the need to be compliant with you know, public procurement legislation. That's their obligation. But the challenge for them now is to be, understand that there's a higher level of commercial acumen and, and skill that's being um, required of them if they're going to take full advantage of the new flexibility. Looking again at um, social value, uh, Shalene has asked if you feel that uh, central and local authorities are changing the way they include and monitor social value for procurement? Um, yes, I mean, I think, well, the social value principles have, have applied sort of from a, you know, for, for a little while. Um, how how well they're understood and what how they're interpreted, I think our, our sense from, you know, anecdotally in the feedback that we've had through these workshops is it varies. Um, in some instances, it could be very much focused on um, employment and, and, and local business benefits. And in other cases, it may be more on environmental or social benefits. Um, so it's, it's clearly now an important aspect of, of how, how public authorities you know, buy goods and services in their various, you know, kind of requirements. Um, but uh, it's sort of fair to say it's it's still an area that, that you know, is, um, you know, not as clear to the wider public as, as it perhaps it should be. Um, and, you know, there's, there's perhaps more that we could do to, to bring awareness of these, uh, to, you know, in through our work and, and, and through the government's own kind of discussions on its, its own um, legislation. Thank you. Um, we've probably got time for one more question, and this is uh, quite in depth. Uh, so James has asked if you can say a little about whether your analysts of um, competition looked at the structure of procurements, um, as he has a feeling that a lot of procurements are structured as large single lot deals with the same con subcontractors appearing in multiple bids, therefore uh, masking the absence of competition for some components. Uh, he said this is particularly the case where package software is brought through the system um, integrators. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think every category of procurement has particular features. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, that there's an opportunity for government to get, you know, better value for money by, by really understanding what's what that you know what the market is capable of delivering and how competition can do that this sort of the prime contractor versus the subcontract kind of elements you know that that is another important feature here sometimes contracts um are um you know there's a, a group of intermediaries that that sit between um the, the government and, and a major OEM and in other cases there's a major prime contractor that sits in between government and a huge tail of smaller businesses so there are you know there are there are quite different dynamics for competition in those two scenarios um, you know, and I think I think government needs to you know really make sure that it understands these issues um, so yes cl clearly it's an important theme um, I don't think there's necessarily you know there isn't a magic solution to this. I think our, our, the reason why we put out the commercial life cycle was to emphasize that all the way through this process, there are aspects that people need to think about. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for sharing your uh, work and insights with us this morning. I think you certainly got um, a good amount of feedback and grillings. Uh, there, there was a lot more questions, unfortunately, that we ran out of time to answer, but I will um, email them on to Matthew, um, and if he has time, I'm sure he will um, get back to you on those. Um, so thank you for joining us. And also thank you to our sponsors for making these webinars possible. And again, thank you uh, to so many of you for joining us and contributing to the discussions today. Uh, don't forget to check out uh, the forthcoming events on our website. We've got lots more um, webinars coming up over the coming weeks. And I'm wishing you all um, the best for the last day of January. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody's quite challenging questions and for listening to my pace through this. So thanks very much. Really enjoyed it. They always are challenging questions, which is great. Thank you.